All right, so our meeting is in progress and it is being recorded and again we're pleased to have Ken Bagstad, a research economist with USG, as presenting for us today on ecosystem services. Um, Ken? Thanks so much, Genevieve. Thanks for having me and thanks everyone for joining. Um, I'm going to start off today um, talking about a number of tools and methods that we have underway to map and understand the value of ecosystem services across the landscape. Um, we've been applying these at a number of sites in the country. I'll mention that I did my master's work and postdoctoral work in Arizona, so some of this work is based in the desert southwest, although really examples come from all over the country and the world. And um, I'll close talking about um, how we can think about climate change and climate change impacts and tying that with ecosystem services. I'll mention as well that, um, that I'll briefly touch on, um, on some thoughts and some research we've done on valuing uh, migratory species. I know there's some folks with fish and wildlife that are involved with the, uh, with the LCC and others who may be interested in ideas about migratory species and ecosystem services. So I want to start off by acknowledging um, a number of my colleagues across a number of different agencies and, um, and research groups at universities. Um, there's a lot of work I'm going to describe here, which certainly would be possible without a great network of collaborators, so I just want to start off by thanking some of those folks. Uh, the idea of ecosystem services, I, I just like to start off at this point. I was, a, I was a big fan of Calvin and Hobbes as a kid, and I, uh, I spent um, just about every waking hour of my childhood outdoors, so this, this resonates with me quite a bit. I'll give folks a moment to, to digest it. So really the idea that, uh, that ecosystems has value isn't itself a new one, but, um, and as I started going through my academic career, I started wondering, yeah, how, we, how can we put a, a value on nature and really understand um, its intrinsic worth and its importance to the economy and society? And um, before I got started on my PhD work in economics, um, I uncovered the field of ecosystem services, which I've been working in for a number of years now. Um, and really, um, it's, it's a simple concept, but of course, it's, a, it's very complex. We need to think about human systems and social science, which includes economics, but it's not limited to economics. Uh, we need to look at all kinds of natural science, uh, everything from nutrient cycling to, um, to the hydrologic cycle to, um, to weather and climate. So a number of complex systems that are interacting here that we have to understand in order to really get our hands um, we all know, I think, um, by this point that ecosystem services are getting a lot of play and a lot of interest, um, not just on the academic side, but from federal agencies. And um, I'm working, of course, with USGS, so we work with a number of different agencies and thinking about how to use ecosystem services in their decision processes. And we've had a number of um, a number of high-profile um, reports and documents and guidances come out in recent years. Everything from the PCAST report to the, the 2012 forest planning rule, some of the work done on the Department of Interior's economic contributions that started us down the path of using ecosystem services and management. So there's a lot of interest from Washington and from the Washington offices of these agencies. But one of our problems is that, of course, many of our field offices, um, particularly in the West where um, our field offices may be responsible for managing millions of acres of land and, um, and all the typical um, resource use, management, um, conflicts and issues, um, NEPA and other regulations. Um, so we don't have all the expertise to be able to do this, this kind of thing in-house in many of these field offices for the agencies. So the question becomes, how can we, uh, how can we get this, uh, this mandate coming out of, um, out of the Washington offices to actually be used more readily and more easily um, in the field? And that's where a lot of my interest has gone in the last couple of years with the system services. How can we bridge this gap? There's a lot of folks who are interested in this. There's a group out of Duke University um, that's chairing the National Ecosystem Services Partnership that's been thinking about how to do nationally applicable approaches to ecosystem service assessment and bringing it into decision making. So that's involved um, folks from across the federal agencies as well as a number of 
of university partners. Uh, we've been working on a guidebook for federal agencies, which I believe is planned for unveiling it um, at this December's ACES conference in Washington, D.C. Um, so, so a lot of work has been going on and a lot of people thinking about this issue. Um, one of the initial projects I did for BLM, um, this started in 2010, um, had, the, had a sort of joint mandate to uh, look at the landscape of what, what are the ecosystem service tools that are out there? What are the methods people, people are developing to measure, model, quantify, and value ecosystem services? And there were a lot of them. Um, and so we started off first just with a survey of what's out there. And you'll see an alphabet, a real alphabet soup of acronyms. But, um, but that there's a lot of methods out there. Um, they have their strengths and weaknesses, and some of them are, are more useful in, others, uh, in uh, certain circumstances than others, as you'd expect. Um, so a lot of different tools out there on the landscape, which, um, which our review that came out last year was one of the first um, to sort of um, get a handle on this overall landscape of ecosystem service tools. And one of the things that I've taken going forward out of this is that, um, that of course, as you'd expect, um, mixed methods are often appropriate. Um, there isn't typically one, one tool or one method that's going to be perfect in every time. So we need to be smart when we're thinking about how to, how to combine these. One of the first um, sort of classes of tools that emerged um, was, which came out of the uh, fields of ecological and hydrologic and other physical process modeling was this idea of biophysically modeling ecosystems. So we'd take a GIS database um, along with ecological knowledge, what's termed an ecological production function. So for something like soil erosion, how does, um, how does precipitation and um, Soil characteristics and vegetation characteristics play into the landscape's ability to retain soil, for instance. And we know that there are equations that work uh, well for that in some circumstances, but not well in others. So how can we think about combining GIS data with ecological knowledge um, and physical um, science knowledge from across the sciences to map ecosystem services? And we saw some of the earliest maps coming out. Um, that we're really starting to get a handle on how to quantify trade-offs, hotspots, and co-benefits of ecosystem services. So those are the real advantages of the spatially explicit approach. One of the approaches I've been very actively working with over the years um, is, a, is a method called ARIES, which, um, which we've published on. And this gets at the idea that ecosystems provide value to people, but people are, aren't always located in the same place. We know that. Um, Water travels across the landscape. Aesthetic information travels across the landscape. People uh, move across the landscape to visit recreation sites and to transport ecosystem goods to people. So we need to look at um, where, where ecosystem services are generated, where their demand's located, what the spatial connections are, and what might happen along the way. So there may be the depletion, for instance, of flood water, which might be a good thing, or there might be um, the um, the you know reduction in available surface water, which might be a bad thing that happens to um, to a physical quantity as it moves across the landscape. So we've really started to think about how the uh, the spatial dynamics of ecosystem services play into each other in terms of where they're provided and where they're used. Um, this biophysical modeling is great, but it misses a really important piece of ecosystem services, and that's cultural ecosystem services. And these are the things um, that are highlighted in this box on the right side of the slide. Some of the, some of the less tangible, often more difficult to um, put a dollar value on ecosystem services. But we know they're important. And anyone who's worked in the management context know that, knows that stakeholders often assign a high value to them. So there's another, uh, another um, group of methods that we've been using, which basically asks people to allocate value between these different um, different cultural ecosystem service value types and to put points on a map for, that correspond to the places that they value. And we can use a tool that was developed by some of my colleagues at USGS called Social Values for Ecosystem Services, or SOLVES, to map out the locations of, of value for these, um, these cultural ecosystem services. So it lets, us, um, it lets us quantify and map these cultural services. And we can think about what's the relationship between the landscape that provides them and could we build models that would transfer to places where we don't have primary data? That's something that um, my colleagues are actively working on. 
So what we can do with, with that data about the places that people value, this is an example from the um, Pike San Isabel National Forest in southern Colorado, and you can see places that people have valued for, um, as in this case, aesthetic value. Uh, we can look at a number of underlying um, landscape characteristics like land cover, distance to roads, distance to water, uh, and elevation, and we can build a model um, using MaxSense that relates the value points and their intensity to those underlying environmental data layers. So that's just what um, what Solus does, and this is an example of that, that we've used to generate a map of a cultural ecosystem service. Um, again, non-monetary with a value ranging from uh, from zero to 10, as you can see. So quantitative, but um, not mapped in physical units. And really, uh, really what we're, we're realizing is that these, uh, that one model fits all again is a realistic paradigm. Um, we can use uh, social values mapping that I just mentioned. Um, that's sort of this red or pinkish circle um, at the bottom, this Venn diagram. Um, in some cases, there are deterministic models that are well vetted in the literature that, uh, that may be really uh, appropriate for measuring and valuing an ecosystem services, a service. In other cases, probabilistic approaches may be, uh, be more appropriate. So uh, we're trying to get the best assessments and to use the whole landscape of tools to produce the best assessments and choose the right tools. And what, we, uh, what we're striving toward with both the biophysical modeling and the public perceptions of the cultural ecosystem service modeling is to understand um, places that provide a high amount of ecosystem service and places that people recognize as providing high social values. And the key here that we think um, is that this can help, uh, help managers identify areas of conflict or management synergy on the landscape and places where if you have a particular scenario for management, you may uh, you may either run into support or, uh, or potential conflict for a proposed action based on the, the uh, location of places people value and places that um, provide a lot of an ecosystem service. Um, so we, we're trying to use this framework, um, and I'll give an example in a moment here of, of how we can do this for public land managers. So we have a case study that we've, uh, that we've written up now for the Pike San Isabel National Forest in southern Colorado. Basically, we surveyed households um, that live within 45 m miles of the forest so that we can generate those social value maps that I just showed. We did a number of biophysical models for locally important ecosystem services, carbon, water supply, uh, sediment, yield, and view sheds. And we basically generated hotspots using a statistical tool for that. Um, We've done this for the Pike San Isabel, but we are, we're expanding the analysis to five other national forests in Colorado and Wyoming, and two national parks, one in uh, Colorado and one in North Carolina. So uh, basically, this is what we get, this, this showing the um, this two by two matrix, where we have um, the red is high modeled ecosystem service value, high biologically quantified value, and high social value, places that people recognize. The green is um, high biophysical value, but low publicly perceived value. The yellow is a high social value, but a low ecosystem service production, and the blue is low for both. So um, we can say that the areas that are high and high, those are those are the places where we may expect uh, management synergies or potential conflict if there was something that was going to conflict with the existing public use. The yellow would be places where um, people see that area isn't expected to have a big effect on ecosystem services. The green would be places where um, there some form of uh, raising awareness might be needed to highlight the value of ecosystem services because we know they're important, but uh, the public may not be aware of it. And the blue might be places where more intensive uh, resource use might be possible. One of the really interesting things we found out of the study was the overlap with wilderness areas. And um, the black outline here are wilderness areas. The triangles here are the are 14,000 foot peaks, which are the the huge, um, really charismatic and popular areas for folks to recreate around. So, um, we're we're expanding this analysis I mentioned to a number of more rural national forests that aren't right up against the front range population centers, and we expect that we'll see some different patterns with how people value wilderness. So, 
I think there's some really interesting things we can um, we can find for management this this type of map tag, mapping approach. I mentioned um, some work done in uh, Arizona. Uh, I did my master's work and some uh, postdoctoral work on the San Pedro River, and this was also related to the BLM project. Once we got a handle on what ecosystem service tools are out there, we started to um, we started to say, well, which um, which tools can we actually use to map ecosystem services, and how well do their results align with each other? So. Um, the San Pedro Riparian National Conservation Area was a, was a BLM um, management area of particular interest, and so we held a workshop. We identify and we identified important services to map there, uh, which are shown here. So uh, another study that was basically a parallel study to the the Ecosystem Service Tools Survey asked how well the modeling different modeling tools agree with each other, and this is really important. Um, for purposes of replicability, for purposes of understanding when um, when a certain model is going to be stronger than another one. So um, the ARIES and INVEST tools were two of them that, um, that I used for this project and basically looked at the difference in values when running an open development scenario where there was lots of urbanization and lots of new development across the basin and a constraint scenario where there was uh, was still some urban growth, but it was more directed into certain areas. And finally, a local um, a local um, restoration project to restore um, native grasslands and to manage mesquite in the southwest, which, as we know, is a is a common management concern or problem. So what what we found out of this study was that the uh, the biggest landscape change, uh, this open development scenario, there was relatively good agreement between the two models. And as we got down to finer and finer scale uh, changes, we saw less agreement between the different types of models. So this suggests that um, you know that that the different models may have um, you know they may have diff had differences in their um, in their coefficients and in how they accounted for the ecosystem services. That when there was a small change, um, there was poor agreement between the models, and when there was a bigger one, um, there was better agreement. Um, more change across the landscape of different types that may have equalized itself out. So this was the first uh, study that that we know of that actually compared multiple modeling tools and. Um, I've seen a few more of these coming into the literature. A lot more of them are needed, again, to understand um, where tools perform well, how well they agree, and how we get more consistent and scientifically um, unbiased answers to our ecosystem services questions. I mentioned the BLM. We're also doing some work now with the National Park Service to, um, similarly to BLM, first of all, to think generally about the questions of how to use ecosystem services in agency planning. Um, so we're working at a national seashore in North Carolina and at Rocky Mountain National Park here in Colorado. And one of the things of real interest to the Park Service is how, um, how ecosystem services cross boundaries. So the management decisions made off of Park Service land affect um, national parks and publicly owned and managed resources and how benefits from parks flow to other people, um, which are, are long-standing management questions for parks, but um, what are the types of things we can we can start to answer with these um, with these ecosystem services flow mapping tools that I was shown, uh, mentioning earlier. So for this North Carolina project, um, just to give an example, we're, we're doing a series of surveys and as I mentioned earlier, we asked people to allocate value between a number of different value types. We describe what the value type is and ask them to allocate different points or values. And then we give them a map and we, we ask them to, to put locations on the map that they value. In this case, we're, we're looking at um, values for surf fishing for the summer beach going um, res uh, visitors, so two different visitor groups. And we've also surveyed residents of a county um, located near the national seashore. So what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to look at how the, the values and the value locations of these different groups differs. Uh, as for the San Pedro project, we held a stakeholders and scientists meeting where we ranked the top ecosystem services of concern, and I'm in the process right now of mapping, modeling, and valuing those ecosystem services for coastal storm protection fisheries and um, impacts to water quality. 
Another coastal project we have right now is, uh, is working in Hawaii with the Pacific Islands Climate Science Center, and we're working on um, basically looking at the values that coral reefs provide for recreation, fisheries, and for coastal protection. And we're looking at the impact of sedimentation and land management practices and how, how that sediment affects coral reefs and coral reef health and coral reef ecology values. And we're also looking at climate change, um, things like sea level rise and ocean acidification and how those can affect uh, ecosystem services provided by coral reefs. So this is a project that's just started that I'm working with a, a research group out of Hawaii to, uh, to build models and maps and a toolkit that they can use in the Pacific Islands to understand ecosystem services and impacts related to climate change. I'm going to switch gears um, from the sort of landscape scale modeling and briefly talk about migratory species. This is another area that, um, that um, I've been working in with some of my colleagues and understanding how, um, how migratory species provide value across the landscape and thinking about how their conservation can benefit people across uh, long distances because, of course, these species migrate in some cases hundreds or thousands of miles. So we've been, uh, this was this is work that was initially conceptualized by my colleague Darius Simmons, um, who was the PI on a Powell Center working group, where we looked at northern pintail ducks, Mexican free-tailed bats, and monarch butterflies, so important species that migrate continent-wide, in this case between uh, Canada, the U.S., and Mexico. And really the challenge here is that, um, that all of these species provide important benefits to people but their habitat, uh, they have different levels of habitat dependence across the range, and those habitats are threatened in some cases uh, very, very severely. And the question becomes, could we take the values that people hold for a species in one area and use that to de design uh, novel conservation approaches for the species in the place where its habitat is most under threat and um, where that habitat conservation is really needed to maintain this continent-wide uh, migration phenomenon. So in order to do that, um, the initial conceptualization um, requires us to look at the annual value of ecosystem services generated by the species. So where does it generate a particular type of value? And which parts of its habitat does it most depend on? And so this takes both economists and biologists working together to build models of these two regions. And we can calculate uh, what's term, what we term a spatial subsidy, so how much a region is providing value to um, providing economic value by having um, a high degree of habitat uh, importance and a, and a corresponding low degree of ecosystem service value importance, or vice versa, areas where, um, where a species is really important but perhaps not quite as um, as dependent on habitat in that particular part of its range. So this, this will be a little bit clearer when I give an example on the next slide. Um, so for northern pintail ducks, we're working this up right now. And again, I mentioned this for monarchs and, uh, and for Mexican free-tailed bats too. Um, but for this example, we've looked at the value that ducks provide for, uh, for hunting, for bird watching, and for uh, also subsistence hunting in the far north. In the among native, um, native groups in northern Canada and Alaska. And so we've, we've gotten a monetary value for those ecosystem services for each of the regions. And our colleagues who are, um, who are waterfowl biologists have mapped out the relative habitat dependence. And what we can see is that a particular region, in this case, the, the this southern breeding region or the prairie potholes, has, has always, under conventional wisdom, been, been said to be really important for um, maintaining the continental scale populations of pintails. And in this case, we see it does have a very high habitat dependence. On the flip side, um, the values, particularly for hunting and bird watching, are really important in California and Oregon. They have the highest value. So when we run that equation shown on the last, uh, on the last slide, we see that um, California and Oregon are receiving a benefit of $12.6 million from the rest of the range. Um, similarly, the Prairie Pothole region is providing a benefit of $11.9 million to um, the rest of the range uh, for, for people who value ducks for all these different reasons across, across the range. So the 
idea is then how can we capture some of that economic value and use it to help fund conservation in the most, in the most threatened and in the most important areas. We found a number of interesting things as we worked up these case studies. We have a paper um, in press now. And um, if you've been watching the news, you know that um, monarch butterflies are under severe stress right now. The, the population arriving um, and wintering. I'm sorry about that. I don't know how to turn that off. I may have to just wait for that to ring for a moment. Um, the, uh, the monarch population that arrived in Mexico last fall was the smallest ever recorded. And we know that agricultural change is causing huge threats to monarchs across their range. And um, but at the same time, as one of the most charismatic insect species, they provide a lot of value, and we know that. So we're trying to use that information to raise um, awareness of the importance of, uh, of monarch conservation. Um, we saw pintails, an example here, um, where they're generating um, close to $50 million a year in benefits for recreation just for a single duck species. And similarly for uh, Mexican free-tailed bats, we've looked at the economic value that, um, that they provide for folks who travel to caves and parks and bridges and who watch bat emergences at night in the summertime, as well as their value in controlling, uh, controlling pests for agriculture, in this case just for a single crop, but, um, and, and we know that there are other crops that they provide uh, uh, values for as well. So all these species provide a number of values. And so our next steps, I mentioned, is to understand how we can uh, we can design conservation markets or other incentive programs to, to help conserve these species. We can think about the impacts of climate change on these species and how that will affect habitat quality and uh, the importance of particular ecosystem services and the threats to habitat that might occur, so how we might allocate those conservation dollars. And there's, of course, other species we could extend this to aside from the three that we've initially pioneered. This diagram on the right is just showing basically how much different regions are willing to pay for monarch conservation in other parts of the monarch's range. So how we can think about um, the financial mechanisms to, um, to protect the species. So the last, I, I talked about a number of different methods for us to use for, um, for valuing and mapping ecosystem services. One of our real goals that I mentioned in one of the first slides is to, uh, to reduce the barriers to the routine use of ecosystem services and decision making. And that means that each study can't be a five year, five million dollar study. We need to find ways that people can get good answers. We can do them more quickly and um, without you know, taking a team of PhD level scientists in order to do that. And I think there's some exciting developments on the horizon that are, that are going to enable that, um, hopefully sooner rather than later. And, and when we can do that, we can, really, um, we can really get a better handle on ecosystem services and really start using them more in day-to-day -day decision making for agencies and managers. So the ARIES project I mentioned, I've just, I've just very briefly touched upon it, but, um, but basically what we're doing with that is we're building a library of data and models um, that are supported, that the data can be pulled by modelers anywhere in the world and, and the system will select the most important or, or the most relevant uh, data and models for your region of interest based on a series of if-then statements. So we tell, we tell the modeling system that if we're working in an arid environment, there's a certain set of ecological or biophysical or socioeconomic relationships that are really important to providing or to demand for that ecosystem service. If we're working in a humid region, there's a different set of rules that apply. So we can, we can build in a, um, an intelligent system that will choose the right, um, the right models and the right data for the right context. So that's something we're very excited about uh, rolling out in the next few years. The INVEST model has been probably the best known and most publicized of all the ecosystem service models. And one of its um, real limitations that we ran into in the San Pedro and that a number of its other users have reported is the difficulty in parameterizing the models. Um, so one of the things that's really exciting that the INVEST folks themselves have taken on is to, is to have a database of what model coefficients should be used and where. And as, as that's used, that, that should lower the barriers to using INVEST on a more regular basis. In all cases, um, I think meta-analyses and, and an understanding of when certain relationships hold under which conditions is going to be really, really helpful. 
and a really valuable effort on the part of, um, of physical scientists and ecologists to, uh, to let us know when and where to use particular relationships for ecosystem service modeling. I mentioned that SOLVE, this, uh, this idea of cultural ecosystem service mapping, it's dependent on surveys and it's dependent on people um, locating their value uh, for particular cultural ecosystem services in particular places. And that's, a, uh, that's something that um, takes a new survey each time, of course, as any social scientist would tell you. But one of the things we're excited about is the ability to look at the relationship between the places people value and the underlying biophysical environment and to build models that will transfer. And so we're testing out, um, some of my colleagues that is, are testing out some of these methods in the Rocky Mountains in Colorado and Wyoming. And we'll also have a number of coastal sites which are shown on this map where we can look at how well, uh, well SOLS models correspond and how well we can predict um, the things that people will value in coastal environments. There's a number of other different um, different things from online web surveys to mobile apps that, um, that um, some of our colleagues are working on that are also trying to lower the barriers to data collection for, um, for understanding the places people value. I'm going to close by uh, bringing us back around to climate change, of course, which was uh, part of the title and I know one of the areas of interest uh, for many of the folks on the call, and how we tie climate change back into ecosystem service modeling. So of course, one of the challenges has always been um, how do we how do we get spatially explicit data that we can feed into the models at an adequate resolution that will matter the whole downscaling issue in uh, climate models, the issue of which climate model we select, um, and how that has an influence on um, on the results. Do we select model A, model B, some kind of ensemble of models? Has always been a question. Um, but regardless, and, and I think some of those my knowledge of the, of the climate modeling community, some of those uh, questions are gradually getting parsed out and improving. Uh, but thinking about it from the ecosystem service side, our first step is, of course, to identify what are the, what are the drivers of change and, and how are those going to affect ecosystem service provision. So thinking about the two projects <coughs> that are most involved in climate change right now that I'm working on, uh, granted both outside the desert southwest, but the one in North Carolina and the one in Hawaii, what are our impacts or drivers? Well, we have sea level rise, we have changes to ocean temperatures, we have ocean acidification, and we have land-based climate change impacts. So all these things might feed into the models. So thinking about the places where climate change impacts are going to change the, the processes that will influence um, ecosystem service provision and model results. We need to think about um, specific outcomes and how they enter into the models and actually get a range of possible changes for North Carolina, where we have a certain range of sea level rise scenarios that we're going to be testing. Um, we basically are going to be developing the, the proposed changes for the climate scenarios for Hawaii this summer. So until we get to the, uh, until we get to the um, of quantifying this. I'm not going to show any results for these studies. They're both underway, obviously. But one thing we can do is we can think about, uh, you know, we can generate hypotheses about how we expect climate change to impact ecosystem services. And this is important, I think, to do from both the supply and demand side. So um, how is climate change going to impact ecosystems' ability to provide um, ecosystem services, both in terms of climate and precipitation and temperature itself? its effects on plant and animal communities, um, its effects on, uh, on physical processes, and what are the likely trends in demand? Are people more likely or less likely in the future to depend on the service? And the, this demand side is really important um, from a valuation perspective. I'll talk about that in one of my closing slides. So essentially, um, you know, I, I, we've not continued work in uh, Southeast Arizona, but were we to do so, I think there's evidence that demand for all of these services that we looked at is on the rise, and a lot of the there was uncertainty about whether precipitation is going to change um, and the climate is going to become drier or wetter in, in many parts of the south. Um, there's there's the warm and wet and the warm and dry scenario that uh, that we hear about, and so a lot of a lot of question marks on this one, but. I'll show in a moment how, how these, uh, these up and down arrows can influence value. In uh, coastal North Carolina, um, we 
we expect, for instance, that many of the ecosystem service supplies may become more limited. If we have sea level rise, if we have more frequent storms that are impacting the barrier islands and their ability to provide services, we may have less of a number of these important services available in the future. And yet again, as population grows and as the, the vulnerability of the system increases, we expect in many cases to see increasing demand for ecosystem services. And a similar picture in Hawaii, we expect that particularly under the stress that coral reefs are facing, uh, both from climate change and from land-based runoff, that their provision of many of ecosystem services may decline in the future, while at the same time um, demand for those services, both due to population growth and um, increased vulnerability, we expect to increase. So this idea um, that um, both provision and demand for a service is important because, um, stems from the fact that we have more beneficiaries. When, when population grows and more people are dependent on ecosystem services, um, there, there's often a, a case to be made that there'll be more demand and we'd expect ecosystem services values to be greater. Um, essentially, that higher demand and use can result in a feedback which uh, which produces more ecosystem degradation in the future. And so really we want to be thinking about adaptation, technical substitutes, ecosystem management, and demand side management. So how can we, how can we manage ecosystems and encourage people to use them or not use them in a way that preserves ecosystems for the future, both for their own sake and for, and for the values that people, uh, people gain from them. But again, making sure that those values are provided indefinitely into the future and that they're not being eroded by, by short-term demand. And really, it's, it doesn't uh, take much looking. This slide, I, I think I put this slide together about a year ago when these two, uh, these two climate-related tragedies were, were in headlines. You can find plenty of more recent examples than them. But, um, but our hope by combining ecosystem service models and climate change data and good climate scenarios is that we can use that information to build more resilient communities and ecosystems and that we really have a choice as a society. Um, the, the sort of simplistic thinking for folks who, um, who are new to the, to the ecosystem services world is that high value may be a good thing. Well, in reality, high value ecosystem services often mean that there's high a combination of high demand and low supply. And that may, uh, that may, as I said, reduce um, the resilience of the system. That, that may lead to their degradation and to ecosystem services not being uh, provided over the long run. So really, if ecosystems were abundant enough and demand was low enough or kept at a management level that ecosystem service values were lower, um, that may be a good thing in, in many cases. Um, just some things to think about from the economic side and how we can build, how we can use this information to try to increase or maintain both ecological and social resilience. So there's a lot of work still to be done here. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for, um, for modelers like myself and folks who are knowledgeable about climate change and climate impact and managers to work together on, uh, on bringing science into management. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of exciting ways we can go in the years to come. Uh, I'd like to end it there and um, feel free um, to ask any questions. If I don't get to your question, um, feel free to contact me at this, uh, this email address. I'll do what I can to, to provide you a good answer. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, so I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, if anybody on the phone has a question, please uh, unmute your phone and, and speak up. Hey, Ken, this is Abe Springer. Have you guys incorporated any cost avoidance functions in of your valuation models yet? Yeah, we have. Um, at the results I showed for the, um, the San Pedro, uh, we were looking at, um, well, we were looking at avoided and replacement costs for, um, for water in particular. For services like carbon, we've looked at social cost of carbon. Um, so really, it depends on the service, which um, which uh, economic method is going to be most effective. For a lot of our sediment work, um, avoided cost could be the most um, the most sensible method for looking at the the cost of dredging or removing sediment from a river. So. 
I didn't I didn't actually show a lot of economic values on um, on these slides because in many cases we've been interested in the in the results we've published on uh, in showing the uh, the degree of change and not the value but it's certainly in, in many cases especially with avoided cost it's easy to add relatively easy I should say to add uh, add values that are appropriate for the region of interest. Any other questions? Uh, I, I've got one. Hey. Sure, go ahead. Great. Hey, this is Andrew Housing with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Thank, thank you so much for, for an excellent presentation. Um, it, it really gives me, I, I, find, I find it heartening because it clarified and, and, and provided more detail to you know the, the state of affairs in, in ecosystem services because it, it certainly seems like I've been hearing for the last decade how, how that's a, a, a whole lot, line of work that that's getting more and more developed but I haven't seen quite the same level of, of uh, progress as, as is inferred in your, in your slideshow so thank you so much for that I do have a general question which is as we're looking at di different desert LCC projects and, and trying to either weigh, weigh the selection of new project proposals or evaluate the the effectiveness of of past activities you know maybe in a, in a restoration context had so, so many river miles improved by by metrics XYZ are you finding that that kind of the economic outcome of that is is the most influential one of the more influential aspects of, of these ecosystem services, so you can say so many dollars were, were, were saved and that allows you to communicate to a non-scientific, more, more general public, perhaps political arena? That's a great question and um, one that we encounter a lot. And really, I think, <laughs> I think like most economists, we want to have our cake and eat it too with the, uh, with the monetary values because they do add a lot to the discussion and that um, – that Department of Interior economic report uh, to the president, which um, which was prepared every year under the uh, when uh, Ken Salazar was the secretary, and uh, I I don't know if it's uh, continued to be prepared, but I would assume it I assume it will be at least periodically. Um, you know, there was a real interest in we can monetize jobs, we can monetize economic impacts to local communities from recreation. That's been done for decades and is from an economic perspective is fairly cut and dried to do, then can we put a dollar value on some of these other benefits, like you said? And when we can, it, it really lets us directly enter the cost-benefit analysis, which is great. That's a, That can be a step forward to it for us. But then on the flip side, cost-benefit analysis by its nature forces us to ignore or trivialize at least the services that we can't easily put a dollar on, like a lot of those cultural services. And if a project... Um, you know, if a project still shows up uh, in a cost-benefit analysis to uh, to not perform quite as well as we'd hoped, um, you know, does it get does it itself get trivialized, even if it's providing benefits that we know are harder to quantify? So, I think cost-benefit analysis is definitely a double-edged sword, and it, I think most of the people that are talking at a policy level about using ecosystem services are fairly aware of it. But it can it can provide benefits, but it um, it also may force us to still leave some important things out of the equation, which isn't always a good thing. Thank you, Andrew. Um, there was somebody else who had another question. Hi, Ken. This is Dwayne Poole. I have a question for you over the same sort of line of, of thought, and that is that Historically, we've thought about when we put existence values to sort of the non-market game species, non-game species, the non-market valued species, we tend to assume that we were undervaluing them. Are you aware of any work that's gone on that's looked at sort of the sort of quasi-option value type approach to developing values for those that would say, you know, here are examples where something has gone away or has gotten onto the endangered species listing or whatever, so now we can start to articulate the cost of losing that species or near losing it? I don't, that's a great question. I don't know of any uh, concrete examples, although they certainly may be out there, but um, it's an important point. And the Monarch study that I mentioned is, it's essentially a, 
a non-use value study, that it's looking at the, uh, the existence and the quest value of monarchs because, uh, you know, monarchs, they don't, they don't provide food, they don't pollinate any crops, they don't eat predators, they're just something that we, we value and ditto for many of our endangered species. So um, it's, a, it's a great point, um, and I don't know of any studies like that off the top of my head, although they may exist, and if they don't, it would certainly be something worth looking into. You should fund them. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Any other questions? Yeah, this is Philip Murphy. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Mur uh, it's Philip Murphy from University of Redlands. Um, sort of along this, on the same lines. I mean, one of the aspects of desert species is that a, they're usually in places that people don't get to visit a lot, and two, they're often very light users of the ecosystems they live in. So it's it's hard often to to claim that they are a, a critical piece of the ecosystem. So, I mean, how can we, you know, how can we make the case for uh, the creatures? And then, if you take a creature that spends most of its time underground, is, there, is not even there to be seen? How can we, in, in this world of uh, e uh, eco services and valuation of eco services, how will we will be able to make a case for these creatures? Yeah, so that's another great point. Uh, I, when I started uh, work on ecosystem services in the deserts, uh, one of the things that came out was that. A lot of desert species and desert ecosystems have been drastically undervalued, and I don't think this was an intentional um, or a malicious bias, but um, there's a paper by uh, Costanza et al. that came out in 1997 that attempted to value the, the entire world's ecosystems, and they put a value of zero on deserts. They, they really did, which for folks who have lived in or worked in desert ecosystems, that, that was a real head-scratcher. But um, you know, deserts, they're not, as, they're not as biologically productive in terms of pure NPP. Uh, they're often more sparsely populated. People have to travel farther. So a lot of the, and there were at least historically uh, fewer universities doing research in this area than, you know, in some of the, in some of the wetter coastal, more densely populated places. So I think, um, I think there was at least this question of, well, how much are desert's really worth? And, and there have been some good studies that have come out that have, have gotten a better handle on that, and in some cases actually shown deserts to be, um, to be really important. I mean, you think about some of the, some of the population centers, um, the Phoenixes and Tucsons and Las Vegases of the world, and just how critically dependent they are on, um, you know, particularly water, but also recreation and, and all kinds of other services. So, um, I don't know that I'm doing a great job of answering your question, but I'm agreeing that there are some unique challenges, I think, in deserts that are a little bit different from what we face in coastal ecosystems and in wetter parts of the world. Thanks. I think it might be a great topic for the LCC to think about is um, uh, a focused approach to understanding how we might, how we, how we go um, services approach will either help or hinder how we get people to think about the desert. So that sounds like you're volunteering. <laughs> I wouldn't have the knowledge, but I could help a little bit. I do a lot of stuff that does the tortoise. <laughs> um, we do I have, have a question. question. Oh, is this Susan? No, this is Carol Klopatic. Okay, Carol, go ahead. And then we have a question from Susan uh, Rich. Um, I have a question in regard to ecosystem services relative to discussing it with decision makers that when you bring up, uh, for example, water and ecosystem services and you talk that against a potential project that is a money-making project that could actually hurt that ecosystem service, they glaze their eyes over as soon as you say those words and cannot understand what that function of the ecosystem service and how much value that it ha that it has, and I've been trying to do this since basically the Costanza paper came out. And you know, being in deserts, it's it's very very difficult, and that's one of the things that I do as part of my job in communicating that. So, I what luck have you had that you could actually go ahead and say yes, you've been able to go ahead on the political realm win points and get that point across? Yeah, the uh, that's a that's an outstanding question as well. Um, Obviously, working for USGS, I do more science than advocacy these days, but, um, but I will say a couple of things about messaging and communication, which is, just, uh, which is I think, equally or in many cases more important than the science. Um, 
there was a paper or there was a survey rather that the Nature Conservancy commissioned three or four years ago that was asking people about this term ecosystem services and does it resonate well with you? Um, are there alternative terms that um, that really uh, are evocative or are a little bit easier to understand? And what it found, unfortunately, and maybe maybe the, you know all of us scientists in the room are probably shaking our heads as I as I say this, but ecosystem services scored one as one of the worst possible alternatives. Right. It's not easily understood by the general public. It's not an evocative term. It doesn't it doesn't convey the criticality of nature to our economy as important as it should be. So um, what what did score much better was was the value of nature and the value that nature provides. So getting getting a little bit less technical and, and more direct, I think, is important than this this kind of vague term of ecosystem services and and natural capital, which is the other term you hear a lot, didn't score well either. So that's um, I think that CNC study is really instructive for communication. The other thing, um, I, I saw a great uh, piece that had been put out um, by Carpe Diem West, which is a group that manages water in the western U.S., talking about effective conservation messages, especially in, uh, in rural and western and often more politically conservative communities, and how, um, how conservation messages have been both successfully tailored to local values and how they haven't, and I think we need a lot more thought about how to uh, about this messaging side of, of the equation. So it's really important. But I think that TNC and the Carpe Diem study are both really good uh, starting points for many of us interested. And and if it's helpful, if if folks are interested in it, I can uh, I can pull together some links of some of the things I've meant and uh, send them to Genevieve if she wants to make them public. That would be great. Thanks, Ken. Good. But in, but in terms of successes, what successes has actually been out there when you're looking at it? Because, you know, I've come from a scientific perspective and trying to go ahead and work with the science policy and then the politicians, and then there seems to be this loss because they can't believe what you're saying that this service is actually works X as composed compared to rather the 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 quantity of money that's going to come out of this project. They can't they don't believe you know the the science side in terms of that service is really worth this value. Sure. Well, I think the uh, you know you ran into that a lot with the Costanza paper, for instance, and that right. was justifiably criticized by a lot of economists for. Uh, Cutting way too many quarters, uh, making some really unrealistic leaps of faith with the science, but I don't think you can make the same criticism a lot of a lot of the ecosystem service studies coming out today. So if if the if the economic science is being questioned, I think we're standing on a lot firmer footing than we were uh, 15 years ago or even five years ago, which is which is good. Um, I mean, if there's doubt and skepticism. Uh, <laughs> That's another challenge to be overcome, but I think the quality of the economic estimates is improving. Is improved, okay. Yeah. I, I, there, there are examples out there about actual use of ecosystem services information and decision making. Um, there have been a couple of good papers that are trying to summarize all that, all those lessons. Um, again, I can, I can. Dig That'd be wonderful to see those. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Um, and then we do have just a couple more minutes, but Susan Rich had a, a question. Um, and, and Susan, are you still on the line? Okay, it looks like she. If you if you unmute yourself, yeah, you I'm, can ask I'm your here. question. There you go. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I was hoping that we could go back to that last slide and just look a little bit more about the the relationships that were discussed? The relationships between what? Um, go, can you go back one slide? Oh, sure, of course. Yeah, it was about the, the um, demand and supply, essentially, relationship and, and the potential for um, increasing the resilience of that ecosystem. I'm going to actually pull up another slide from a different presentation, which okay. Thank you. Um, actually sort of inspired this one and is going to better answer your questions. Um, 
Um, so this is a this is a really nice paper that came out a couple of years ago that basically talks about how um, as something becomes scarcer, its value typically increases. That's that's a basic precept from economics. But in natural systems, we see um, you know we see a lot of ecological and biophysical thresholds, and we may even see thresholds from the socioeconomic side in terms of rapid changes in demand as something something becomes scarcer. So um, what we see without without getting too much into economics is, is into the economic theory is that as something becomes more scarce, its marginal value, the value for one more unit of it becomes increasing. And in this case, we've got an ecological threshold where when uh, the natural resource is super abundant, um, depleting just a little bit more of it and converting it over to some, um, you know, some sort of built um, or um, quote productive, I, I hate to use that word, but some kind of uh, more traditionally traditional economic sector um, doesn't have a big change on the value. And as we start to lose more of it, its value really increases rapidly, um, very rapidly. So the idea here is that we would use different economic policies in different regions of this demand curve and where, um, where nature was, um, was more or less abundant. So in cases where um, nature was super abundant, it might be um, it might be productive to um, just say that uh, we're going to attach a per unit cost to the extraction and use of nature, and that that's going to make sure that it's going to economically efficient uses and not being wasted, and that we're not, uh, not sort of over exploiting nature beyond a certain level. Once we get into this zone where nature becomes really scarce and valuable, we may want to um, we may want to put uh, you know put caps or limits on how much of nature can be exploited and converted and used, and we may want to use, um, I mean, this, this took on some interesting political meaning, but, um, but the idea of cap and trade for natural resources is probably more efficient in this region where, where our, the resilience of the system is dropping, the criticality of natural capital is declining. And then we get into a region where, where nature is so um, Nature is so scarce that really it's hard to even put a value on it. That the classic example I've heard here is the Atlantic rainforest down in Brazil, where it's really just patches of this former ecosystem left. And we need policies that will increase resilience. We need we need um, you know actual restoration dollars flowing. So that uh, to to get us back to an area where nature isn't so so scarce and where is that capable of, of surviving and carrying on and providing benefits for its own sake and for people. So that's, okay. that's maybe a little bit more of the economics of it, but, um, but different, um, different policies are appropriate under different um, settings. And ideally, again, we're, we're moving or we're keeping ecosystems in a place where it's closer to this end of the curve and farther from this, from this end of the curve. Okay, so the relationship the potential for um, restoring resilience as the, the amount of input it would take to get back into the more resilient. Right, right. Okay. Thanks. All right, we are um, at the top of the hour and um, out of time for today's comp. Uh, conference. However, um, there is one other question from Lindy Brang Brigham um, about valuing the impact of invasive species. And um, maybe, Lindy, you could send that question to Ken in an email, if that'll work. Um, as, a, as a reminder, we will be posting this presentation on our YouTube channel, and um, it will be recorded in full for that. If I would encourage anybody else, of course, who has questions related to this topic, this was a really good discussion. Um, obviously, there's quite a few uh, questions uh, related to this topic of ecosystem services, and if you would like to hear more about this, please uh, let me know, and, and we'll make sure that, that we help coordinate additional conversations and, and a different additional topic areas related to this. Ken, thank you so very much for presenting today, and thank all of you for joining us this morning. My pleasure. Thanks again, everyone.
in the Unicorn Columns.